Hello and good afternoon or good morning or good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us in the inaugural first ever private AI webinar. I'm very pleased to have Patricia here uh, with us, who is uh, finishing her PhD in privacy preserving machine learning, and who we also work together on at Private AI, doing all sorts of really awesome machine learning powered um, privacy preservation for companies of all different shapes and sizes. So Patricia, thanks so much. Thanks so much for uh, organizing this talk. And thank you oh. everyone. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, so no problem I will at all. start by sharing my screen. Here we go. Um, guys, a quick bit of housekeeping while we're putting this together. Uh, there is a chat and questions section um, up in the upper right of your screen. So as we're running through here, if you do have any questions that pop up, we'll save some time at the end to deal with them. Um, total runtime here should be about 20 minutes. So get your questions in early so we make sure we have a chance to uh, to address them. Um, so without further ado, Patricia, kick us yeah, off. And if, there are any, if there are any questions throughout, please feel free to ask them. Uh, can you see my screen okay? Coming through loud and clear. All right, great. So we're going to be talking about cybersecurity and privacy and what they have in common. And the first thing that we want to do is really define what these terms are. And so data privacy in the GDPR is defined as empowering your users to make their own decisions about who can process their data and for what purpose. Okay. Whereas data protection, which is something that often gets confused with data privacy, means keeping data safe from unauthorized access. Okay. And cybersecurity also gets confused with data protection. Um, is the practice of protecting systems, networks, and programs from digital attacks. Okay, so really what we need is data protection in order to have privacy, and to have proper data protection, we need cybersecurity. Does cool. that make so, sense? I mean, like so what far? we were talking about beforehand, mm -hmm. yes, absolutely. The idea that sort of data protection is kind of the overarching goal, and cybersecurity and privacy are sort of two different strategies under which there are different technologies that help achieve that in summary. Is that kind of right? Yeah, that's correct. And cybersecurity also encompasses other uh, other things like ways to prevent DDoS attacks, for example. OK, awesome. Mm -hmm. OK, so what are cybersecurity and privacy all about? They are both about compliance. So things like the GDPR, the CCPA, LGDP, PIPA, HIPAA, PAPAYA, a bunch of these regulations that are popping up all over the world. Here you've got some from South Africa, from Brazil, from um, California, from Europe, right? These are multiplying and becoming, and privacy and cybersecurity are really central to complying with them. So privacy in particular is, as mentioned before, about giving your users the ability to say what they want done with their data, what is and is not okay to do with their data. Um, it is also often about the ability of getting, uh, giving them access to whatever data you have stored on them. It's also about uh, their ability sometimes to delete their data upon request. So uh, that's the right to be forgotten that you see in the GDPR. And in order to have that proper uh, data privacy and data protection, uh, you need a proper cybersecurity infrastructure. These are also about maintaining customer trust. So without proper, uh, properly providing your users with the choice of what to do with their data and without uh, having the right cybersecurity infrastructure to keep their data uh, secure, uh, you're often going to run into cases where uh, there's a data leak, uh, where there are user complaints about what's happening with the information, think things like Cambridge Analytica. Um, and 61% of people said they won't buy from a company if they don't trust how their personal data is handled. That's a Cisco study from 2019. They're also about building better technology because without uh, privacy and cybersecurity, uh, or privacy enhancing technologies, that is, and cybersecurity, um, you can't unlock uh, certain data sets in order to use in your processes. And you can't also build products that users trust. So if you're not building products that users trust, uh, ultimately, you're not going to be able to iterate over uh, how these products based on user feedback. And they're very much also about peace of mind, right? So you're going to sleep much better at night if uh, your chances of getting fined or of getting uh, your the data compromised are uh, minimal. I'm really curious to know, I mean, based on all the conversations, I guess, that we've been having with companies um, in sort of all different types of verticals, 
which of these philosophies are kind of more motivating when people are considering privacy and cybersecurity? Mm -hmm. Great question. So people often think compliance might be the more, more motivating one, but a lot of the time compliance actually isn't. It's usually about customer trust, about what their customers are asking for. Uh, that's what we've been seeing. And it's often also about getting access to data sets that would otherwise be inaccessible. So I would say second uh, most important one here would be building better tech for the people we've been speaking to. Awesome. Thank you. Pleasure. Okay. So pets toolkits. Uh, what can you do uh, for with privacy enhancing technologies? You've got secure multi-party computation, homomorphic encryption, data de-identification, differential privacy, secure enclaves, data synthesis, a huge bunch of options that, you know, how do you decide which one to use uh, in under which circumstances? And how do these combine with the cybersecurity infrastructure uh, and tools that you're familiar with? So for cybersecurity, there's network management, threat detection, access control, antiviruses, firewalls, all things that we're really used to building upon one another in order to ensure the security of a company is as close to 100% as uh, humanly possible. Of course, we're never going to get to 100%, but these can be combined with privacy technologies in a way that gets us a little bit closer. How can we do that? First of all, one thing that we could do is combine uh, data reduction for more fine-grained access control. Now, data reduction uh, is particularly useful when you want, for example, uh, your developers to be able to access certain data uh, that doesn't include personal identifiable information in order to process it. Uh, or if you are, uh, for example, trying to look at a, video, a security footage video and see if some theft took place. And you don't need everybody's faces in that video in order to determine if a theft took place and you could reintegrate the people's faces uh, if there is actually a segment where you need them. So um, there's AI that can help a lot with this. So NLP in particular can help redact personal data and quasi identifiable information from text, images, and video. Uh, and computer vision can help redact things like faces, license plate numbers, and more from uh, images and videos. And uh, here you might wonder what the difference is between things like personally identifiable information or directly identifiable information and quasi-identifiable information. So personally identifiable information or directly identifiable information are things that will identify an individual directly, uh, like name, exact names, name, first name, last name, um, phone numbers, social security numbers, and quasi-identifiable information are things like age, height, uh, approximate location, where if you combine multiple of these, uh, they, the likelihood of re-identification grows exponentially. So um, any questions there? I'm kind of curious to know. Um, I think uh, I was talking with someone at one point who didn't really care about um, user access controls because they thought like, cool, my developers have access to our data from our production environments in their dev environments. Um, but because they're covered by our NDA and company policy and training, that's totally okay. So why would I bother, you know, de-identifying um, information when I can trust my employees? How yeah. does that sort of fit within this setup? That's a great question. So uh, if you are thinking about compliance in particular, uh, the GDPR, uh, for example, requires you to be able to track wherever percent and file information are stored and how they're processed. The moment that you're sharing that information across your organization, uh, you're often having it stored in locations that you might not be aware of, uh, processed in ways that you might not be aware of. So even if you trust your employees, uh, they might not know what they should and should not be doing or should and should not be uh, tracking uh, with, with the processes that they're doing. So by stripping away the personal identifiable information right before you send it to them for whatever purposes they need, um, you are, essentially uh, capping your risk uh, when it comes to getting fined uh, by the GDPR, for example, for not appropriately answering an access to information request or, or a request to be forgotten, uh, or for not appropriately tracking um, data that you otherwise would have had secured in a more uh, strict perimeter, for example. Awesome. 
Uh, we also had a question roll in. Uh, someone was asking about like what's the best way to handle information that you've stripped. So let's say you've got production environment that you've redacted to give to developers. What do you do with that redacted stuff? What's the best practice there? Mm, great idea. Uh, great, great question. So. Um, it really depends on what your setup is and what the processes are that you have to uh, get this data through. So you could either uh, throw it out uh, if you don't need it at all. Uh, you could have a second ghost database where you have the person and file information included within your data set, uh, and then one data one database with everything stripped out, um, and then just have a very very secure. Uh, and very limited access to the one that contains PII. Um, and another option is to have our de-identification as a filter to the queries that are occurring to a database. So, um, and another option uh, are, for example, uh, keeping unique IDs for the PII uh, with directly within your redacted text, images, or video, and those unique IDs be associated to uh, the person and file information uh, encrypted and stored in a separate location. Okay, so it sounds like I mean that final answer there actually ties into another question we just had asked around um, if you strip data of PII, how do you I mean, would, are you not at risk of losing control? And if someone sort of contacts you in the right to be forgotten context and ask you to retract that data, how do you then be able to piece that together and prove that you've removed that information? Mm. So it sounds like if you have some sort of unique identifier stored in a separate library you can still sort of find that person's information and make sure it's removed from your own environments. Uh, yes, there is that. Um, but there's also the addition that if you are stripping away person identifiable information, it's no longer information that you need to forget, right? Uh, because it's no longer associated to the individual. So uh, if you do have something that's properly anonymized, which is a pretty strict, it is a pretty high bar, uh, but if it is properly anonymized, uh, you don't have to have one permission from the individual, at least under the GDPR, to anonymize data, and then you don't. Uh, it no longer falls under uh, data that needs to be protected as strictly as uh, the non the data containing person and file information. But that is especially only if it if it is fully anonymized, which is very very high bar. Yeah, we could probably do a whole other webinar on like does de-identified or anonymized data even fall under. Uh, the terms of the GDPR. Um, but maybe that's when we loop in the legal experts for <laughs> the next round yeah. of webinars. Yeah. Awesome. Good to know. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Um, privacy and cybersecurity also blend in very nicely for better network management. So uh, under a lot of uh, data protection regulations, including the GDPR, you need to track, as I mentioned, where uh, person and file information are stored. And right now, over 80% or about 80% of the data that's produced uh, online is actually unstructured. So that means that's a lot of data with very that we have very few insights around, about. Uh, so in structured data sets, even you might have fields that say notes, for example, and then there might be unstructured data within even what you th assumed would not have person and file information beyond the names of the columns that you were aware of. So ultimately, identifying where there is person and file information in the huge amounts of data that companies are collecting uh, becomes a job that's really infeasible for humans and really actually optimal for uh, AI and specifically for NLP and computer vision algorithms. Yeah, so this ties into that question. I mean, we were talking about with a partner who's in retail who, I mean, when people at the point of sale system, they were editing people's accounts and changing their addresses in notes sections because whatever their system was awful and couldn't properly edit things. Mm -hmm. So they were actually sitting on a bunch of PII in a structured, or what was supposed to be a structured field, but became unstructured data that they didn't even know they had. So there's kind of this sort of network sprawl, um, I suppose, that's happening right now, where people might be sitting on more PII than even they were aware of. That, as you say, is a good use case for AI, because it's like searching for a needle in a haystack to have someone go through all of your files and figure out where everything lives. Exactly. Yeah. So essentially, once you locate where the person and file information is, is actually stored, then you know what kind of defenses you need around the, the data that you're storing. And that's yeah. a great example you just cited. Okay. So another uh, tool that's used a lot in cybersecurity is, of course, encryption. So often either symmetric encryption or asymmetric encryption. Uh, you might be familiar with AES, RSA. Um, 
And what these are used for are for encrypting data at rest and for encrypting data in transit. But then you've got this giant gap where data are being uh, decrypted in order to process. And this is where they're at the most vulnerable, right? So there are a few options if you're if you are dealing with very, very uh, sensitive information, things like credit card numbers, social security numbers, uh, where you have determined processes that you want to do on that to perform on that data. Um, and those the options are things like homomorphic encryption, which allows you to perform computations on encrypted data. A lot of the time for homomorphic encryption, you'll have a client sending some information to a server uh, and that information is encrypted. The server processes it while it's encrypted, sends the result back to the client and the client uh, decrypts it without the server being any the wiser of what they saw. Then there's secure multi-party computation and secure multi-party computation is about a collaboration between multiple parties that don't want to share their inputs with one another, but they do want to share the common output. Um, and one really cool thing about secure multi-party computation is that you can make the output meaningless unless everybody in who intended to participate part actually participates. And then there's trusted execution environments like Intel SGX, which are chips in which anything going into them is encrypted, anything going out is encrypted, and it's only decrypted within the chip, and not even your OS has hacks access to what's being done inside the chip. So these are great if you want to process things faster. Um, it's often used for things like authentication, uh, like uh, Microsoft does it on their laptops, for instance. They use a, a, a trusted execution environment. I know Apple uh, iPhones have them, but there's the one disadvantage that uh, you won't get the same levels of security guarantees as homomorphic encryption or secure multi-party computation, which are based on uh, mathematical guarantees of privacy. Uh, so yeah, any questions there? I mean, I, I hear homomorphic encryption get tossed around a little bit kind of like a sort of a catch-all solution for you know, if we encrypt data at rest and transit and um, now in processing, that's kind of like a failure for, for most situations. Um, are there any limitations there that people should be aware of? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think that there are very, um, there are people who are very into different technologies uh, and think that there's some technologies that just fit all problems and why not just use those? Um, homomorphic encryption in particular is really, really great when you're, have something, for example, that's a little bit more repeatable um, or that you actually want, uh, that, that's actually super sensitive. Um, and the limitations there that, uh, for example, it's, it does take a little more time to code uh, an algorithm in the encrypted domain. It also takes longer to process um, and uh, it doesn't fit all use cases. And we have a pets decision tree that can help you decide uh, exactly which kind of solution works best for your use case. But it is fantastic if you happen to have uh, algorithms that can either be approximated using polynomial uh, polynomial equations or uh, are just polynomial in nature. Perfect, thank you. Okay. Pleasure. Okay, um, and another, um, it, it doesn't really count as a privacy enhancing technology, but I guess it's more of a privacy enhancing technique, uh, which is processing data directly on the edge. And arguably that's actually the safest way to process your data, never collected in the first place. Um, it's really great for, for certain things. Um, Apple and Google uh, both integrated uh, federated learning into uh, for some of their, their algorithms where uh, in Gboard in particular for Google, where they're pre help, they predict what is the most likely word um, or what um, was your what your more, most likely query is. And in the iPhone, they do emoji detection using uh, differential pri differentially private federated learning. Um, but not all of us are Google or Microsoft, uh, or Google, sorry, Google or Apple. Um, so if you do want to do a processing on the edge, a lot of the time it has to be a little bit more deterministic or you have to have a team that's uh, familiar with uh, doing machine learning on the edge. Um, in some cases, your data is very suitable for doing processing on the edge. In other cases, you might need to aggregate information for it to be useful. For example, if you're collecting information about traffic. Fascinating, great to know. Um... I suppose, are there, are there any risks 
that people should be aware of when it comes to processing on edge because it seems like an amazing way just to decentralize um, any risk when it comes to data processing. Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? I, you were cutting off a little bit. Oh, sorry. Um, are there any risks about processing on edge that people should oh, be aware any of? any risks about processing on the edge that people should be aware of? Mm, well, hmm, that's a great question. Mm, I mean, somebody could always lose their phone. They could be subject to ransomware attacks. Uh, their, their data might not be you might not be able to back up their data, um, but if you are backing it up, maybe they'll um, you'll be storing it based on their encryption key. Um, if that encryption key isn't backed up, maybe they won't have access to their the backed up data on your servers anymore if they uh, lose their device. But it's not so much risks that can't be overcome. It's really uh, just things that you can you have to account for uh, when you're designing the architecture. Cool. Thank you. Okay, so what I'd like you to get out of this webinar is that privacy is possible and it's also very complementary to cybersecurity. So with that, without uh, proper privacy enhancing technologies, it's very difficult to satisfy a lot of the um, a lot of the requirements that cybersecurity has for keeping data safe. Uh, and it's important to think about. Uh, exactly which screwdriver fits your screw. So it, as I mentioned, we do have a privacy enhancing technologies decision tree on our website, uh, but I'm always happy to answer any questions related to privacy uh, technologies and how they might relate to your problem. Wonderful. Wish that we know that going completely one question very quickly that just came through um, about sort of some of the latest um, sort of uh, chip processing um, and sort of encryption on chip. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned something coming down the pipe there. Is there anything sort of new um, that we should oh, be Oh, about processing to? on chip? So Intel SGX has been around for a while. Um, and there's also some open source uh, projects that are in place. What's the name? Hmm. If you give me your email, I could send you the name of the open source uh, project for uh, encrypted chip processing. For Intel SGX, if you want to uh, process that in the cloud, use it for processing in the cloud, there's Azure Confidential Computing that has, uh, that has these available to uh, its users. And I believe AWS also integrated some in their services recently. Nice. Yeah, I know who asked that question, okay, so great. we can follow up directly there as well. Um, brilliant. Uh, guys, I guess, uh, are there any further questions? Please drop them in the chat. Uh, we're happy to do that. I have also added the uh, privacy and aging technology decision tree um, into the chat section. So if you'd love to take a look, please follow up there. Um, and I suppose, as always, uh, if you have any questions about privacy preserving machine learning, uh, Patricia is available here, and we're happy to chat all at Private AI. Um, thank and you, thank up. you everyone for joining. Otherwise, yeah, thank you, Patricia, for your insights and for everyone for your time. I uh, look forward to uh, running these again in the future. Uh, we'll love to get feedback afterwards. We'll be reaching out for what you did and would love to hear uh, how to make these better. So thank you so much, everyone. Really appreciate it.